playing the cold winter night on the internet crowd. I think it's uh, I think it's a bit of winter term uh, more than anything. Uh, but that's okay. Yeah, that allows us to have a, a uh, an in depth in depth presentation on this topic. So welcome to the University of Canberra. Uh, I think you all know me. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education. I'm your MC for the night, and really my main job besides introducing Tom and all the views I guess I think is to tell you all the chunk of mobile phones. Um, I know I've got mine off. Um, can I start off as we always do at some of the things that the University of Canada? I've not given the traditional custom because I have been coming out of here today to none of the people. I've had my respects to elders past, and I've been extending that respect to all the digital people who have been Can I just give a special guest welcome um, to Dr. Janine Lane, uh, alumna of the University of Canada. I understand our first Indigenous woman to graduate from the University of Canberra, and you can tell from my voice not that not just that I've got a cold, but that the University of Canberra kind of proud of me. So welcome back, and thank you for agreeing to uh, the guest lectures tonight. And can I also acknowledge Tom Kalmar, a uh, Chancellor of the University of Canberra, and the Nunnawal Lecture Series originated as an initiative of the Nunnawal Centre at the University of Canberra to give voice to the Indigenous Australian position on the many topics that shape Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities throughout this country. The Nunnawal Centre itself supports Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, as you all know, through a range of academic and pastoral support programs, and its services have functions as, as if you're like a focal point for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students studying here at the University of Canberra. The Nunnawal Centre has been in existence since 1985, so it's the 30th, it's, it's the Centre's 30th anniversary. And we're delighted to have seen continued growth in enrolments, annual enrolments, uh, in the last few years in our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students. So that's increasing. That's a good way to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Nunnawal no Centre. But what's clear, really clear to us is that we've got a long way to go. And, 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 and perhaps Janine will be touching on this as well. There's plenty of challenges. Um, Oriel Bloomfield and I may be, and I, I, I haven't cleared this program, so I might speak up. I think we gave ourselves a nanoseconds uh, permission of, to be delighted at the recent review of our Reconciliation Action Plan, an independent review, because we're doing lots of good things and lots of recommendations. But what was really clear is that you went read through the first half pages, you got a long, long way to go. There's plenty of other challenges. And that's great. I mean, I think it's terrific that, that we bask in a little bit of glory for a moment, but we've got plenty to go. And, and well, I think, I think my overall position and feeling on this is that I'm kind of confident about the university's commitment uh, in, about the support of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students and staff here at the university. It comes right from the top, and I apologise because many of you were directly from the university, so I think you know our strategic plan, but for those of you who need a bit of a reminder, is our previous strategic plan had 39 steps. There are three objectives in our current university strategic plan. This is the thing that drives all the decisions in the university at the moment. And check them out, they're, they're this. One, to build, to provide transformative educational experiences accessible to everyone, whatever your stage of life and background. Two, to engage in high quality research and creative practice to make a difference to the world around us. And three, to contribute to the building of fair, prosperous and sustainable communities which are respectful of their indigenous past and committed to redressing this damage. It's kind of if that's an unusual set of the three things that drive the university for a strategic plan, I'm kind of proud of it. And, it, and it's that, when I see that, I'm reminded that with that sort of commitment from the very top, and, and if that's driving all our decisions, I'm kind of confident that even the, if we have got plenty to do and plenty of challenges facing us, I think the university is up to the new challenges of addressing the noise and doing what we can to support staff the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff and students. Speaking of being led from the top, it's my privilege to welcome our Chancellor, Professor Tom Kalman of AAO, to introduce you to Tom. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Kwong, and, um, and welcome everybody um, to us tonight and uh, uh, to our second Nunnawal Lecture uh, for 2015. Um, it's a very important uh, lecture series which we, which we all celebrate, and, and hopefully it will be one that grows um, in both participation um, and also in 
in the quality, um, not that it has to grow any more than the quality of the speakers we have, but I suppose we're one of the first ones, so, you know, it's <laughs> getting better every day. Um, can, can I also just uh, remind us that this is going to be recorded and it will be available for students into the future to be able to have a look at. So it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us to, to gain some um, insights into, into one of our, our first Indigenous graduates, or the first woman Indigenous graduate. Uh, can I also acknowledge that we're on the land of Ngunnawal people and the Gambri people and pay respects to the oldest past and present, but also to recognise their youth as we recognise all all youth, uh, their future leaders, the custodians of our uh, stories, our cultures, our histories, our languages, and it's really incumbent on all of us, um, and particularly us in the teaching professions, uh, to grow our youth up to create that resilience that they need to be able to take on the challenges of the future. And it's also the responsibility of you to take on those challenges and, uh, and not be passive participants. Can I acknowledge Dr. Janine Lane, um, firstly, but also other eminent academics and, uh, and leaders at the university here, and also to pass on the apology of the uh, Vice-Chancellor, Professor Stephen Parker, who, who got called away at the last minute and, and made contact with me just before I got here. Uh, but he does um, uh, wish you well, Janine, um, tonight. And could also take the opportunity to recognise Oriel Bluefield, um, who's here as a strong uh, Indigenous woman, who also works within the university to, to guide the way that, that uh, we work with our, our um, you know, everything we do, both with our Indigenous students, future students, but also with our staff to make sure that we are uh, living up to our expectations, as, as uh, Nick mentioned, um, within the university. And also acknowledge Patrick, the man behind the good woman. <laughs> it's great to be here for the second annual lecture for 24. Uh, 15 and also to introduce Janine Lane, the first Indigenous woman to graduate from the University of Canberra when it was then known as, I don't get up yet, I've got a long way to go, <laughs> uh, when it was then known as the Canberra College of Advanced Education and she graduated from here in 1984. Janine is a Wurundjeri woman from the South West New South Wales. She was awarded a Doctor of uh, Literature and Aboriginal Representation in 2011 following a long career as a teacher at both the uh, secondary and tertiary levels. Formerly a research fellow at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies from 2009 to 2012, Dr. Lane completed a postdoctoral fellowship at ANU in 2014 and is currently an Australian Research Council fellow at the Australian Centre for Indigenous Histories at ANU. In 2010, Janine's first volume of poetry Dark Secrets After Dreaming, AD 1887 to 1961, won the Scanlon Prize for Indigenous Poetry for, from the Australian Poets Union. And her manuscript, Purple Threads, won the David Unikon Award at the Queensland Premier's Literacy Awards uh, and was shortlisted for the 2012 Commonwealth Book Prize and the Victorian Premier's Literature Prize, which is great for us because we are really pushing international poetry here, so we look forward to you to come back, uh, Janine, and, and lead us on that little journey. Janine is the recipient of an Australian Research Council Discovery Grant in 2011 for her project, Reading the Nation, a critical study of Aboriginal secular representation in the contemporary Australian literature landscape, and a Discovery Indigenous Award in 2013 for her project, the David Denyman Awards, shaping the literacy and cultural history of Aboriginal writing in Australia. And it's very appropriate that you're talking at this time, Janine, because uh, we're coming up to NAIDOC Week. And the theme for NAIDOC Week this year is we all stand on sacred ground, learn, respect and celebrate. And it's something that I know that we from Reconciliation Australia from the University are really keen to, to make sure that uh, people do understand that they're on Aboriginal land. We have a little Wiradjuri uh, preschool here and, um, and that uh, learning uh, that they're doing is being shared with all of us uh, at various events here at the university. So without further ado, can uh, you please join me in welcoming Janine uh, as she presents Reflections of an Aboriginal Graduate 13 Years Old. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, thank you to Nick and Tom for that introduction. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who are the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we now stand and pay my respects to elders past and present and their descendants of the future. I'd like to pay my respects to my Wiradjuri ancestors past and present and particularly to the aunties who raised me and I'm from the Murray River. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present here today. Um, thank you, and staff and students of UC and other members of the community who came out this evening. Thanks for coming out to hear this. Um, and so, it has. I have been invited here this evening because it's been 30 years since I graduated from what used to be called the Canberra College of Advanced Education. And we used to make jokes that it had a complex about not being the university. Um, and I'd like to share some reflections on that journey. Um, this is a narrative, a story, rather than um, a particular academic piece. Um, I came here in 1984 with um, my brand new Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of New England. And I'd like to say that I put a lot of um, thought into my choice of this institution. But I didn't. I had originally thought about studying education somewhere else. And I was seriously considering the Northern Territory, you know, somewhere like Bachelor College, Alice Springs, um, because um, I was educated in the South and Eastern Seaboard and keen to work in an Indigenous centre-driven um, curriculum. Um, but I ended up in a different territory because in 1984 I was 22 and I came to Canberra because I was in love with my husband, um, who I still am, still am, and um, hence you see, um, was came to Canberra, and you see was the obvious choice. So I arrived here in Canberra, and um, consequently, you see, late in February 1984, after the applications for the 1984 intake of the uh, grad debut, as it was called, had closed. Um, and to my initial dis dismay, um, I also discovered that due to the colourful history beyond me, that all the education courses for 1984 were under review. And there was no intake for primary school teachers at all, <clears throat> and only a very small intake of graduate positions offered in the secondary program, and decided on by a grade point average, because we all had degrees from our undergraduate degrees, and a written application from the head of the school. So um, a person in the student centre told me, the old student centre told me that I was too late, which I was. But I come all this way and I wasn't going to take no for an answer because I really wanted to be a teacher now. And this person told me um, that there was no point in arguing with her to save my arguments for the head of the school. And so this was all the invitation I needed and I promptly asked her, where will I find he or she? And this person informed me that I needed, the person I needed to speak to was a he um, and I'd, where I'd find him on campus. And I rushed off to the sound of her calling behind me, but you can't just walk in there, you need an appointment. Um, but I was already bolting towards building fire, it was Friday afternoon. I had to close a business um, where the School of Education has always been and I burst through the doors of the old students, as I burst through the doors of the old student centre away, I heard her saying, don't say I sent you. Um, and as I was rushing to the building, I remembered the name of the head of school that I'd been told in the student centre as someone who'd written a very important textbook that anybody who um, studied biology for the New South Wales HSC any time in the last decade or so would know. Um, I didn't study biology, but some of my friends told me it was a good book. So I made a, point, a note of that on my run. And when I got to the office, fortunately, his PA was out. Um, and as I said, by this time it was Friday afternoon, the paperwork had to be done by close of business that day. So I saw this man sitting with his door wide open, and so I just waltzed in, breathless. And he was somewhat taken aback, and he said, people don't usually walk in. They make appointments, 
And so now here's a lesson, I guess, in different cultural contexts and codes of behaviour, because where I come from, an open door is an invitation to walk in. And so I said, I saw your door open. Um, so I thought I would come in. And by this stage, I'd already sat down too, and with some sense of urgency, proceeded to explain how I just arrived in Canberra, and I really want to be a teacher, and why I think I would be so good is because, largely because my own education, I guess, was so bad. And I think it's time for a change. And I think I can do better. And I also fortunately had an impressive academic transcript to show him from my alma mater. And all in all, I kept him talking for at least an hour on a Friday afternoon. And now, whether it was my capacity to apply attrition or my ability to impress, and I suspect it was the former, the attrition at the time. But he let me in and said to the courts and said that I had a healthy impertinence that might suit me well in this career teaching. And so I thanked him profusely because I am good at gratitude. Um, and I remembered to compliment him on the textbook, which I didn't actually read, and ask him what he meant by the impertinent comment. And he said it was a thing about, don't leave your door open if you don't want to be disturbed. <laughs> and opening doors, I think, is an important thing of this evening. Um, and I was happy when I walked triumphantly back to student admin. And whether it was what, my messy writing or the eagerness to get rid of me on the day, but my birth date was recorded wrongly. Um, it was 1963, not 1961. And that is still on my transcript here from UC. So thank you for taking two years off my age and possibly giving me the source of a fake ID if I ever need one too. <laughs> um, so look, I fronted up a few days later to the dip ed, not knowing um, a single person in the course. And I quickly learned a few things. Firstly, that small cohort of less than 100 people that the university college took that year, about 99% of them went to ANU previously and all knew each other. And that the three or four of us among us who didn't go to ANU kept getting asked by other students what we were doing here. I noticed that actually constantly about settler crowds, they're incredibly territorial, always reacting to what is perceived to be strangers in their own space, and it's ironic. But another thing that emerged quite quickly was that I was the only Aboriginal student studying education that year, at least. Um, I didn't meet people across other faculties though, or schools as they were called at the time. Um, and I do say emerge because in 1984, as Nick pointed out, the Ngunnawal Centre didn't exist and there was no place for students to identify, Indigenous students, sorry, to identify and gather. Um, and UC was not alone in this, as it was not until the late 70s and early 80s that any um, Australian higher institutions even began to consider Indigenous people and education and devote space to higher indig Indigenous education centres. And so I was told retrospectively, when numbers did begin to be recorded the following year, that I was the first Aboriginal graduate. But I wonder, and I'm glad Tom kind of clarified that, said the first woman, and that, and I, you know, I wonder, given the perceptions and stereotypes held of Aboriginal people at the time, and still today, to, in some sectors of society, given that there was no place to identify centrally at the, at the university, that it wasn't a priority, um, that people wouldn't ask necessarily, unless perhaps you look really obvious. Um, and it was tough to identify in an all white institution and sometimes challenged. And I wonder, you know, if I was the first, or maybe just the, the loudest. But there, uh, and maybe there were others before me who didn't get noticed, or maybe it was too hard to identify, and maybe their identity was challenged because they just didn't fit the image look Aboriginal enough. Um, and how some people here in, in the School of Education initially really became aware of me was through the activities and discussions within the courses throughout the year. And when I sat on the other side of these lecture theatres, and I never expected to be on this side of the, of the room, 
Um, there was uh, much talk about educational reform and there really needed to be. And discussions revolved around approaches to discipline, classroom management, sexism, gender bias, probably one of the hottest topics of the 80s actually. Uh, actually one year that I, early when I worked here, they actually did add an additive 25 marks to the girls, um, as they were called, the thing we call ATAR, TDRs now, just on that kind of advantage, affirmative action. Ah, uh, yeah, basis. So multiculturalism, but mul the multiculturalism was all about where to fit it in. Um, and this implied people from outside of Australia, not Indigenous people. Um, education for social justice, which of course is valuable, but has to include everyone. And inclusive education, but that meant those with disabilities. And in some cases, home culture itself could be seen as a disability if it was other than white middle class. And the central-based versus the community-based curriculum. Now, all these are important educational issues, but missing from this is any mention or discussion of culturally informed intelligences, multiple intelligences, or in particular for me, cultural literacies, or illiteracies as the case may be. So when it was my turn to present an activity to a tutorial full of potential English teachers in a course called Critical Issues in Education, I gave the group and the tutor an Aboriginal intelligence test, IQ test, and much to their dismay, they all failed. And why they were so frustrated was because the test was actually in English, but not in standard English, and it used English in a way that they were totally unaccustomed to. Like, if I said someone was deadly, what would I mean? They had no idea, they thought it was lethal or something like that. You know, it was a very confusing test for people, even though it was in English, and that's kind of what moved people about that test, that it, um, and that they weren't accustomed to the literal interpretations of the question I asked and therefore the answers were incorrect. My tutor asked for a copy of the test because she thought it proved a good point, even though it wasn't always a point easily accepted, and because the protocols and practices surrounding intellectual property um, were not what they are today, that test got passed around quite a bit. And from, t from that time onwards, um, the, for the rest of the year, I received one or two act reactions from the peers who did choose to interact with me. And I think these are not, even today, uncommon experiences for Aboriginal people to experience, like me. I was either an expert on all things Aboriginal, in instantly, because very few people <coughs> at the time were taught about the diversity of Aboriginal Australia. Or, and this is probably the more common, find yourself having to justify why you don't fit the stereotypes and per perceptions of what an Aboriginal person should look like or is based on what little settler students did learn at school about Aboriginal people written by white people. And the latter having to explain is much more common. Um, and this began my long and ongoing concern in educational settings with non-Aboriginal and more specifically white settler representations of Aboriginal people and how the legacies and the legacies such representations have and how difficult such images can be to disrupt even in the aftermath of Aboriginal self-representations and how past images of Aboriginality impacts and sometimes constrains Aboriginality in the present. So years later when I recounted the story of how I got into UC to a teaching colleague um, and how I wrangled my way into this dip ed at the 11th hour, they said it was a lucky accident or coincidence um, that I didn't know the formalities of not walking into that open door. Um, and it was, and much of my career has been a lucky accident or, or circumstance. And I am the accidental actor. I thought about calling this lecture that. 22 years later, in 2006, I began a PhD on literary representations of Aboriginal people in settler literature. But I had no intention of doing a PhD back then. I walked out of here at the end of 1984, loudly announcing to everyone that I am never going to study again. And my PhD was another accident. It also began, though, right here at UC. And I as I deliver this, I'm consciously reflecting on the past 30 years and what has changed for the better and what hasn't for Aboriginal people, both at this university and in Australia-wide. 
and I'd like to come back to that in, in concluding. Um, when I left here, I began my career as a teacher in 1985, and there was still no central place among either the Catholic education system or the Department of Education or the schools themselves either um, to identify other than by word of mouth or if someone happened to know. Um, and such organisations at the time actually weren't expecting Aboriginal teachers um, or students even too much for that matter, beyond a certain age. And I was a high school teacher, so the attrition rate by then, you know, you're not even expecting that many students, even still in the 80s. Um, and with very few exceptions, there was little or no commitment to Aboriginal education at the time. There were some individuals that you have to always acknowledge were. And I found myself thinking more and more in the classroom as a teacher of English and history that there must be something I can do amid this Eurocentric, time-constrained model of education to at least encourage students to consider that there are other worldviews and perspectives out there and that one thing might just be to pause, one thing I can do in the classroom might be just to pause somewhere in the middle of the late Middle Ages, for example, which I've been mandated to teach, and ask the students to consider what might be going on elsewhere in the world outside of Europe in 1315, beyond the Great Famine and the bubonic plague. What, for example, might people be doing in Australia? How might history be recorded differently beyond this book? And still, I'm still convinced that beyond all the policy documents that come and go on Aboriginal education, Indigenous education, the site with the most potential for empowerment for Indigenous people can be, I'm saying can be, the classroom. And one of the most effective people in facilitating that change can, once again, can be the teacher. But the teacher needs the commitment and support of the school and the greater education system to do this because the classroom can also be a site of great constraint when Eurocentric paradigms are universalised and centralised and cultures um, outside are therefore deficient or deficit. I grew up actually with a deficit model of education and um, they were very predominant in the 60s and 70s and home culture other than Anglo-Celtic middle class culture was considered quite deficit. Um, so you come to school already with a disadvantage. And to some extent, in more subtle ways, deficit mentality towards Aboriginal people still exists um, in and outside of educational settings. Um, I continued to teach in the 80s and most of the 90s, having um, breaks of 12 to 18 months throughout the 90s for my three children. And just as I was about to go back to teaching in 2000, and through my involvement with Indigenous education at a community level, um, I was um, approached to act in a job here at the Nunnawal Centre um, in the foundation program at the time, as it was, alternative access program, which was one of the changes that had come about to UC for Indigenous students since I had left, and a good one. And I had no plans or intentions of coming to higher ed. That's another accident. Um, and I'm pleased to say, too, that by this stage, 16 years on, by the stage since I had graduated. There was a small but growing alumni of Indigenous students um, because of the centre. Um, but change in this area comes in small packages and baby steps. And across the wider campus, very little Indigenous content was being taught. And the, on and the only one subject, and only one subject, sorry, by an Indigenous teacher that was being taught outside the Nunnawal Centre, in the PACE as it was called at the time, Community Education. Um, I went on to apply for and win that job at the Nunnawal Centre in 2001 and was very quickly seconded to the School of Education with another Indigenous teacher, also from the Nunnawal Centre, uh, because speaking of changes coming in small packages, pre-service teachers were still, 16 years after I graduated, not being taught the history or appropriate strategies for engaging or empowering Indigenous students or delivering Indigenous content to all students, whether Indigenous or not which ideally should have been happening. The small change I was talking about was that it was being talked about, at least introducing ed Indigenous education to pre-service teachers. It was on the agenda and now with a mass of three Indigenous academics in the faculty, um, not many, but an improvement on one, it was a good time to drive the writing of 
Indigenous subject that could be delivered by Indigenous teachers to pre-service teachers. Meanwhile, in the time that it took to write this and the somewhat lengthy subject unit, and the somewhat lengthy process of getting a subject approved through the academic board, I tutored and delivered some lectures in a core subject for pre-service pre primary and secondary school teachers called Diversity in Educational Settings. Um, that sought to disturb the myth of middle class, Eurocentric universalism, and examine how ethnicity, cultural background, socioeconomic class and gender are either considered or dismissed in the Australian education system. And within this course, while still totally insufficient, sat the only snippet of Aboriginal content two or three weeks worth of lectures and tutorials, as I remember, over a few years, that I taught in this, um, sorry, sorry, there was only two to three weeks worth of lectures and tutorials, as I remember, and over the few years that I taught in this course, while none of the students were openly aggressive, many of the non-Aboriginal students, mainly, um, Anglo-Celtic students were reticent and some openly resistant to disrupt or interrogate or challenge their views and assume knowledge gained from settler media and literature of Aboriginality and Aboriginal people, even in the face of lived Ab Aboriginal experience. And I started revisiting the Australian literary canon with its array of largely deficient images of us, 200 years of deficient representations in a body of literature, poetry, prose, story, in order to try and backtrack with my students and unpack the origins of this largely erroneous literary history of representation of Aboriginal Australians. And I've always been a closet writer, a compulsive journal writer. In the late 90s, when an Indigenous writers group first began here in Canberra, started by a wonderful woman, artist and writer, who was one of the driving forces of Indigenous education and content here at this university, and for a long time taught the only Indigenous subject that contained Indigenous content, and was taught and delivered by an Indigenous teacher, and yet, who never had a permanent job here. Um, I joined this group and it was a source of much strength and this with my teaching, along with my teaching, I started to, cr to chronicle much of this journey with students over the years. And then when my director reminded me that, uh, that presenting at research <coughs> boards was part of my duty statement and it was about time I did it, I decided to present some of my many thoughts on settler representations and their legacies. And so based on my journal, I wrote a paper called Tracking the Settler Literary Imagination on Aboriginal Country. And I reluctantly went off to this Indigenous Researchers Forum and very tentatively presented this paper. And I say tentatively because I didn't do any research or defer to any critics. I used my journal and some of the seminal texts. But it went better than I thought. And I was introduced and exposed to some very um, impressive Indigenous research and researchers. And one in particular liked my work and suggested a PhD. I laughed at the time and said, no, I haven't got the experience in research. I don't have a clue about such things as methodology, literature review, um, um, at all. But this person, whose work I had already admired and used in my teaching, Professor Martin Nakara, I have permission to mention his name, kept nagging me. And he was good at attrition too, like me, and saying I could use my own voice. And I kept resisting. But at the end of 2004, I had a change of heart and a change of circumstance and I decided pretty much at the 11th hour, again, um, to apply for a candidature at the University of Technology in Sydney, which was where this particular, where Professor Nakata was. And fortunately, I was accepted for a candidature in 2005. 
and subsequently um, applied for a scholarship to allow me to um, applied and qualified for a scholarship that allowed me to study full time. And I left UC there in 2005, early. Um, but the idea for my PhD was actually born here, I have to acknowledge that, from working with pre-service teachers and trying to unravel and unpack ingrained representations of Aboriginal Australians in the socio-cultural landscape. In the beginning, for my PhD, I was going to write a novel, a collective memoir for my thesis. Because as well as my obsession with settler literary canon, I was also consuming as much of the expanding body of Aboriginal print literature as possible, with particular interest in the active self-representations that Aboriginal people bring to the forefront and that speak back to the large, large body of passive separate settler representations. But in 2005, I worked part-time at the Australian Catholic University, teaching in a core unit in Indigenous education, much like the role I had here. Um, and I encountered the same reticence and resistance to destroy disrupt and deconstruct past images and perceptions of Aboriginality, different institution, different cohort of students, but same reactions. And so I abandoned the idea of a novel as a thesis and changed track to um, a pure, well, I mean pure, I mean totally literary analysis of some seminal white settler literary texts that have informed generations of settler Australians and have been on English curriculum since their publication, some since the 1920s. Um, set the text that write about Aboriginal people as a homogenous other. And yes, it is very much an other in these texts. Um, so I decided though to keep writing the novel on the side when I got a mental block from Patrick White or David Malouf or Kate Grenville, or other settler authors that I was reading at the time. And while it was not very easy, I, writing that PhD, I do think that working through some of what I consider um, the tough Western academic jargon and processes with an Indigenous supervisor, a mentor, a friend, as he became, um, made it easier. Um, and that's, in a way, what I was walking at before to PhD. And as I was wrapping up the final draft of the PhD at the end of 2008, but still at least six months out from submitting, and my scholarship was drawing to a close, timing was good for me again, because the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies advertised for a three-year research fellowship for an Indigenous person with a background in liberal arts um, and education and with a doctorate or almost with a doctorate. And I was fortunate enough to win that position and finish my PhD through 2009. And at IATSIS I learnt many things. One was how to write funding applications for the Australian Research Council. And I got the opportunity to pursue my passion for Aboriginal writing. And through an Australian Research Council linkage grant, I was able to work and become the national coordinator of Black Words, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers and storytellers. Black Words is a digital humanities resource for teaching and researching Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander orators, orality, literatures and literature. And it brings together the most extensive collection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stories and print literature, which is indexed and annotated in consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander authors, and indexed mainly by Indigenous researchers. And if you're not already using black words in your teaching, you should be, in your, and if you're teaching any Indigenous content, and even if you're not, it is a great place to expand your knowledge about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander story and storying. Um, and of great concern to me, while I was working with this wonderfully rich and vast resource, 
um, is that despite this wealth of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander orality, oratures, literatures, stories available, and particularly since 1988, its transition to the classroom and its representations of Aboriginality in all its diversity and with the entire agency that comes with self-representation is still very much a hit and miss affair in schools and universities. Um, of course, there are some schools and institutions that do it very well, but some ignore it completely. And that's still the journey that still needs to be undertaken. One of the most enriching experiences for me, while I was at Ayatsis and working very closely with this literature and the storytellers and writers, <coughs> was hearing the oral histories behind the published works. Um, and I was encouraged by many of these writers and storytellers and their works that all in some way or other speak to Aboriginal country with a capital C, Aboriginal country, like Wiradjuri, Ngunnawal, Wanyai. Um, and this idea of reading Aboriginal country has introduced a whole new trope into Australian literature. And these writers who speak to Aboriginal country and disavow the shallow history of the nation's past and present and I was encouraged to submit my unpublished manuscript to the David Uniapon Award, the one I wrote while I was doing the PhD. Um, and I won that award in 2010 for a cycle of interrelated stories called Purple Threads. And I was awarded my doctorate in 2010 too. So in 2012, I moved from Aotsis to take up a postdoctoral fellowship at the Australian Centre for Indigenous History the appeal about that centre is that it is, has a great concern with Australia's deeper past, beyond, way beyond 1788 and the telling of that past through the oral histories of the custodians of country. And when I commenced the task of publishing from my PhD, that is intended as an educational resource, which offers an alternative and culturally grounded pedagogy for unsettling deep-seated images of Aboriginality and considering agentic alternatives by Aboriginal people. And what I found at least, the very difficult task of turning my dissertation into a book, also intended as a resource, but which I'm pleased to tell you is forthcoming and scheduled for publication in 2016. But consuming me all the while while I was working on this book for two years was the oral histories and journeys of Aboriginal writers with whom I spoke to during my time at Black Words and the underutilisation of Aboriginal story and history in the secondary and tertiary curricula. And this, along with the fact that Campbell Newman in, uh, cut the Queensland Premier's Literary Awards in 2012, which directly affected the David Uniapine Award which is the only literary award of its kind for Indigenous creative writing in the Commonwealth and is, uh, is the longest running award for Indigenous people stories anywhere in the world, English speaking world that I have access to um, as a researcher. And since its establishment through the University of Queensland Press in 1988, driven by Aboriginal writers and activists such as Ujuru, the late Ujuru Unicall and Jack Davis, and literary scholars Adam Shoemaker and Stephen Mewkey has been and continues to be a driving force in an emerging and expanding Aboriginal literary canon, which has been one of the most significant interventions in Australia's cultural landscape in the 20th century and continuing. This award has released a whole body of Aboriginal history and story to the Australian public, potentially, that was missing from the cultural landscape of this country before. And the other significant driving cultural intervention <coughs> in the Australian socio-cultural landscape has been Magavala Books, an all-Indigenous publishing house in Broome, Western Australia, established the following year in 1989. And so the scrapping of this award caused a great deal of concern among uh, the local community of Indigenous writers, us mob writing, we call ourselves, and the national community First Nations Aboriginal Writers Network. This drove me to consider the importance and timeliness of documenting the histories and continuance of this award 
The award still does continue in limited form, administered by the state, by the Queensland, on a very shoestring budget, um, not as lucrative or as secure as it previously was. Um, and as many of the writers, um, sorry, um, to document the histories of as many of the writers as possible. And so you need three crucial things when you put together a funding grant. One is the passion for the research. And the most important thing is the support from the community or communities involved. In this case, the community of writers and storytellers, many of whom I had worked with and come to know through Black Words and the First Nations Writers Network. And what emerged through the community of writers when I discussed the possibility of this research was an overwhelming desire and urgency to record the stories behind the books and the greatest stories of the community and the country with a capital C again, to whom the stories belong, and to make these recordings available and as, as broadly as possible through, say, National Indigenous TV or IATSIS to educate Settler Australia about the diversity and resilience of Aboriginal Australia. And these are survival, not victim stories, past and present. And after the first two essential things, the passion and the community, you need the patience um, for the copious amount of time it takes to write a tedious Australian Research Council grant. <coughs> Um, but the grant was successful and commenced for funding in 2014, thus allowing the time and money to work with Unite Upon Writers and Black White Writers published through the University of Queensland Press as a direct consequence of the award and on a collection of oral histories. And IATSIS has an interest in working further with such authors on the dissemination of oral histories and audiovisual recordings at the author's discretion. And all the authors further expressed an interest in publishing their oral histories uncut, unedited, as part of a companion to, black, to a Black Australian writer series intended for secondary and tertiary classrooms. And so that's where I am now, still passionate about pe Indigenous people and education, and still quite loud and pushy about it. And so 30 years on, what has changed? I'd like to think I still look the same. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that I had a few inspirational moments, um, turning points here in 30 years since 1984. And in that time, the university has seen, I uh, have it on good authority from Nick, um, a, a few hundred uh, Aboriginal students graduate. I did try to contact the Nunnawal Centre to find out exactly how many, but didn't have any luck. But that's quite, that is something to celebrate. Um, having that many students walk through these doors is definitely something to celebrate. But for all those doors that opened, um, there's still a long way to go and to spare a thought for those doors that didn't open or that closed too quickly. And I know also, because I was here for some of the initial planning, that there is now an Indigenous Students Studies major available. Um, but I'm also wondering how many full-time academics are employed here. That's an open question, but in terms of how far you still have to go, it's a very important question. And I think it's poignant to consider here as we enter NAIDOC celebrations to the bigger picture. I'll finish on this. That many Indigenous Australians still live well below the poverty line, having generally lower levels of education, poorer health and housing, shorter lifespan, and higher rates of incarceration. Think about this, especially at a time when the federal government is, among other things, considering no longer funding the Aboriginal Legal Service. People talk a lot about closing the gap in relation to Aboriginal people. And that can seem so vast that sometimes people think it's impossible and don't even try. But I'd like to suggest to you that this gap may only be as wide as the space it takes to open a door um, and to keep that door open. So if you take one thing from tonight, Please make 
UC, University of Canberra, please make and keep doors open and more doors opening for Indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you.